thank you. That was a spectacular showing. Thank you all who bid on, uh, on the items, the sports, the romance, all of it. That's what journalism, sports and romance, that's journalism right there, baby. Thank you. So I have two, uh, two quick announcements. First of all, in, uh, list, in uh, mentioning uh, the many uh, dignitaries uh, who are with us tonight, I, uh, uh, my bad, an inadvertent left out, uh, former state CFO Alex Sink is here with us tonight, and I'd like to recognize him. The second announcement, because I know it's on your mind, Iowa 55, Ohio State 24, huh? <laughs> Much like what has happened in newspapers, I didn't see it coming. Really. <laughs> uh, amazing. Thank you, Owen. That's exactly right. <laughs> I'd like to talk quickly about uh, the right field. The Pointer Institute is proud to be home of the right field program. It is a mentoring program for African American and Hispanic young men in middle school and high school that was started seven years ago with the help of the Tampa Bay Rays. The students explore their world by interviewing community leaders and Tampa Bay Rays players and executives throughout the community to, to strengthen their reporting and writing skills, among other life skills. It's a terrific program. We asked a student, Jumani Kokai, to write an ode to Judy Woodruff. He wrote a great one. However, he also qualified for the regional swimming championship. He's a student at Boca Ciega High School. And He's swimming tonight. <laughs> but fear not. We have asked another right field student, Damien Messon, to read the poem that Jamani wrote. So Damien, are you here? Could you kind of come up and read them? Growing up, Yes, and I'm still growing. But growing up, PBS meant Arthur, Curious George, and Bob the Builder. I can't say that I watched PBS NewsHour with Judy Woodruff as a young child, but as I get older, I'm still growing. What's happening in our world is starting to mean more to me. I worry about what's happening in Washington, D.C., North Korea, and even right here in St. Petersburg. Here, we've got a problem with teens, people my age, stealing cars become a life or death issue with some of these teens dying as they drive at high rates of speed. I think teens continue to steal cars because they don't have any guidance to lead them in the right direction. They see friends do it or have family that's been locked up for it. So they think, oh, I have to do this for my cousin or my dad who got locked up. They play follow the leader and get caught up. They think they have nothing to lose. They don't realize their actions can lead to their death. So as I continue to go from being a young man to a man, I appreciate how the work of Judy Woodruff gives me a better idea of what's happening in our nation. I need to know the mistakes to avoid, the dangers that loom, the trouble I need to avoid. That news matters. Judy Woodruff doesn't just report the news, she teaches. As I continue to grow, I need all the lessons I can find because I want to make my life something I once thought it could never be. Thank you, Judy Woodruff. Thank you, Damien. Terrific. The Pointer Medal for Lifetime Achievement is awarded by the Institute's Board of Trustees in recognition of the outstanding career achievement, achievements by a member of the media whose work has made a lasting impact serving citizens in our democracy. It is hard to imagine 
a more worthy recipient than tonight's honoree, Judy Woodruff. <laughs> Pioneer. That's the word you hear universally when you ask about Judy Woodruff. Some other words you hear, respected, dedicated, passionate, up the middle. I guess that's three words, but you hear three, up the middle. <laughs> While these are descriptions to which we all aspire, in today's chaotic media and political environment, such characteristics and Judy Woodruff truly stand out. Judy was born in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Her father was in the Army, and Judy lived in two countries and five cities by the time she was a teenager. The family finally settled in Augusta, Georgia, and Judy graduated from Duke University with a degree in political science. She then, after some thought, pursued a career in broadcast journalism, and like many women of the era, found it hard to land a good job. One news company boss told her, I already have a woman reporter. I don't see why I need another one. She eventually was hired at a CBS affiliate in Atlanta and worked her way to NBC as a correspondent covering the presidential campaign of Jimmy Carter. On the campaign trail, she met the irrepressible Al Hunt, who is here with us tonight, great journalist from Bloomberg. And He was then a Wall Street Journal reporter. They were on the campaign trail together. They would marry three years later and would raise three children. After the, after the election, Judy moved to Washington to cover the Carter administration, one of the few women on the White House beat. It was a few years later on that very beat that Judy was the first to report that Ronald Reagan had been shot. And I think I heard her say earlier today she was only 20 feet away from the president when that happened. In 1983, Judy moved to PBS and worked a decade as chief Washington correspondent for the McNeil Lair News Hour. She also hosted a documentary series, Frontline, with Judy Woodruff. It was around that time that Judy's support for journalism included a stint as a member of the National Advisory Board of the Pointer Institute. She set us on our way even back then. In 1993, Judy joined CNN, where for 12 years she hosted the popular show Inside Politics. She eventually returned to PBS. It is said that Ted Turner was very upset to ultimately lose her, or maybe that was in retrospect, I don't know. But <laughs> And uh, worked as a chief political correspondent at PBS, as well as doing more documentaries. In 2013, Judy made history when she and the late Gwen Ifill also a trailblazing journalist, were named co-anchors of the PBS NewsHour, the first network broadcast to be anchored by two women. The show received several Emmy nominations, and Judy has been part of Emmys for a couple of decades. And they were also the first two women to ever jointly moderate a presidential debate. Judy has long been dedicated to helping women in journalism and is one of the founders of the International Women's Media Foundation, an organization formed in 1990 that to this day continues to advocate for women around the globe who are vulnerable, trying hard to pursue world, the world, uh, acts in the world of journalism and need an advocate. It is a great organization and Judy is one of the co-founders. Thank you. Now, these career achievements are only a slice of the Judy Woodruff story. Judy and Al's firstborn son, Jeffrey, was born with spina bifida and later suffered serious brain damage during some subsequent treatment. Yet through tenacity and perseverance and the support of his family, Jeffrey has gone on to a productive life, and Judy and Al have raised millions of dollars for medical research and are tireless advocates for families with children facing similar challenges. As NBC's Andrea Mitchell put it, behind that composed presence on television is a woman of incredible strength. 
So let's just put it this way. Judy Woodruff is for sure a pioneer. She is also one of the great broadcast journalists of this generation. And she stands as a role model for women and men, both as a professional and as a person. Let's look at a video prepared by Pointer's Al Tompkins. Nobody ever sat me down when I went to work for NBC in 1975 and said, this is what a journalist is and this is what a journalist does. It was just a given that what you do as a reporter is you go and you cover the story mm -hmm. and you are a, an observer. You're not a participant in the story. You don't give your opinions. Uh, it was always a given that uh, the reviews of reporters are not something that the audience is interested in. Uh, that was something I learned working in local television for the CBS affiliate in Atlanta. Hello, I'm Judy Woodruff. I'm 28 years old and I've been a reporter for WAGA-TV in Atlanta for the past five years. This river attracted a nobleman, James Oglethorpe, to bring a ship full of people from England to settle the new colony of Georgia. Mr. Carter obviously thinks he has provided that leadership and believes he has a record to prove it. The delay was seen by the Reagan team as simply the first necessary concession if the president was to get his tax cut. This is Frontline. I'm Judy Woodruff in New Hampshire, where the headlines are saying Walter Mondale will win big tomorrow. She cares deeply about uh, getting it right, and she cares deeply about uh, being fair to the people she's talking to and reporting on. Okay. I have never figured out how Judy balances everything. She has three loving and devoted and very challenging kids who are uh, not averse to giving her a hard time. And of course she has to live with Al Hunt and that's, you know, a burden that she has to bear. When push comes to shove, family is the most important thing. But journalism is pretty close behind. Uh, and uh, uh, we've been blessed to have three wonderful children, one of whom was born with a birth defect, spina bifida, and that's made a difference in our lives. And I grew up as an army brat. I was born in Oklahoma. My father was an enlisted man in the army. Neither one of my parents went to college. Um, my mother in particular wanted me to be, to have a career and not to stay home and have children and raise children as she had done. She was a wonderful mother, but she wanted me to go to college, get an education, and to uh, have an independence that I think she felt she never had. That clearly was a driving force in my life. Another influence in my life was the fact that my father was in the Army and we moved a lot. I, I went to seven different schools between kindergarten and seventh grade. So I was uprooted a lot, didn't like moving around a lot, but along the way I learned that there was a big world out there and there was a lot to know about it and by golly I wanted to know a whole lot about it and um, staying in one place was not going to be the way to do it and so even though I didn't have somebody whispering over my shoulder you know hey what about journalism I always had this sense that there was something out there that um, that uh, I didn't know about and I wanted to find out about welcome back everybody my guests tonight are the first female anchor team in national television news I'd love to meet the man who hired them please welcome Judy Woodruff and Gwen Eiffel <laughs> so passionate about how important it is that uh, journalists go out every day and do the best job they can and cover the story wherever it is, whether it's in uh, Beirut or Baghdad or whether it's right here in New York City or Washington or Houston, Texas, uh, that the American people are not well served unless there are journalists who are prepared to go out every day and work really hard to get as much information as they can, not to take yes for an answer, not to take no for an answer, but to keep asking questions and keep probing and keep making phone calls and keep pushing and keep pushing because that information, that free flow of information is the lifeblood of this democracy and we've never seen it the way we see today. We would not be the great country that we are, the democracy that we are, without the free press 
that we enjoy in the United States of America. It is my great, great honor to present the Pointer Medal for Lifetime Achievement to Judy Woodruff. And please join me in welcoming Pointer's newest faculty member, Indira Lakshmanan, to the stage. You're welcome. She is the uh, Newmark Chair in Journalism Ethics and has covered campaigns, coups, and revolutions, reporting from the US in 80 countries for the Boston Globe, Bloomberg, International New York Times, NPR, PBS, and others. And she also happens to be longtime friends with Judy and her husband, Al Hunt. Indira, thank you so much. And thank you, Judy, for being here. This is such a thrill. I, um, I want to begin by saying that, like so many people of my generation, I grew up watching Judy Woodruff reporting and anchoring from Washington. And for me, she has always been the gold standard and a role model, a journalist who gave us the facts calmly and credibly, never tarting it up with drama or opinion. Um, it wasn't until I had launched my career and was fortunate enough to get to know her that I learned firsthand what a genuinely caring, heart of gold human being Judy is. And I witnessed firsthand the time that she puts into bettering journalism by promoting the careers of others who've come after her, especially women. Thank you. <laughs> it's true. And a decade ago, I was fortunate enough to work as a national political correspondent for Judy's amazing husband, Al Hunt, another legendary Washington journalist. And they were both so generous, not only in encouraging my career, but also in taking a very personal interest in supporting my struggle for my then one-year-old son, who endured years of treatment and relapse with leukemia, and is now happily healthy and here in this room to celebrate celebrate Judy <laughs> somewhere out there. Um, <laughs> there he is. And uh, he had to be here tonight um, to celebrate Judy, who, whom he regards along with Al as unofficial fairy godparents. <laughs> Um, Judy and Al have been so strong and inspiring through their own decades-long journey, caring and advocating for Jeffrey, who, as you heard, um, was born with spina bifida. And uh, through all of that and their careers, um, Judy somehow had the energy and the determination to raise millions of dollars for other spina bifida patients and families, and that is who Judy Woodruff is. So. Judy, I am just, I'm thrilled that Pointer chose you for this incredibly well-deserved honor and so touched that you asked me to help our guests tonight get to know the real you behind that anchor they see on TV. So, that means no tough questions, Indira. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm sorry. I'm still getting over the description of Indira. I'm visioning Indira in her crib looking out at a TV screen with me <laughs> reporting from the White House. <laughs> Um, all right, so you are without question a female pioneer in the news, helping pave the way for the rest of us. How did you break into TV? Well, you 
probably got a little touch of it. First of all, I just want to say I'm blown away by this. The, the Pointer Institute has been, as you heard uh, from Neil a few minutes ago, a place that I have honored and respected for so long. I did serve on the advisory board for a time back in the 1980s, so I've known of Pointer's work, and to have this hanging around my neck is very, very special. I'm, I'm blown away by tonight by the support here in this room for the work that Pointer does. Uh, I, am, I am just touched, touched beyond words. Um, how I broke in is, is um, to make a very long story short, um, I did study political science and after thinking about working in politics, a couple of professors said to me, well, did you ever think about covering politics? I applied for a job as the newsroom secretary uh, for three TV stations in Atlanta, because back then it was three networks, ABC, CBS, and NBC. Only one of them gave me the time of day. He was the news director with, at the station that did the least amount of news, paid the lowest salaries, had the lowest ratings. Um, <laughs> and he gave me, he hired me to be, I, I, came, I flew down or came down to Atlanta from Durham, North Carolina on my spring break. At the end of the interview, I can still picture it sitting there in the lobby of WQXI television. I got up I, and he, Mr. Bill Conover said, you're hired. I got up to walk away and thank you so much. And he said, besides, as I'm walking away, how could I not hire somebody with legs like yours? <laughs> so I would love to tell you that I had a great comeback in DERA, that I whirled around and had some sort of Bella Abza, Gloria Steinem worthy <laughs> Uh, comment, but the truth is that I just sort of slumped my shoulders and said, oh, <laughs> and slank, slunk out the door um, because I didn't know what to say. I mean, I had been offered this job. Um, that was the time that we lived in. It was the spring of 1968. Um, I really wanted to get my foot in the door, so that's what happened. And then, go, and then fast forward a couple of months, I have the job, and Neil referred to this, I uh, kept bugging the news director to let me go out with some camera crews uh, to learn something. And he, and he said, at one point, he said, why are you interested in doing that? We already have a woman reporter. So that was then. And thank goodness, we have come a long way since then. We've come a long way. We'll get to it later. But some of that stuff about the legs is unfortunately still out there. But we'll, we'll talk about that. But you, you know, your first break at that station was being what they called at the time a weekend weather girl. Right? That's another story. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is what really qualified me to cover the White House, by the way. Um, uh, the, I'd been there for a year. I'd been pestering this news director. And he finally said, look, I've just fired the weekend weather girl. That's what they call them. And he said, uh, uh, why don't you go ahead and audition? And I said, I said, no, I'm not really interested, as you know. I want to be a reporter. And he said, well, look, I, you know, the truth is, if you don't get some on-air experience, nobody's ever going to want to talk to you about being a reporter. And I thought that seemed like backward logic, but that's what he said. And so the pressure was on. I managed practically to get laryngitis as I worked my way to the audition. I was hired uh, to be the Sunday night 11 p.m. weather girl. Uh, and it was like Cinderella. I would come in during the week and, and answer the phone, write letters for the news director, clean the film, we used film back then, uh, and, and basically be the, the person who kept the newsroom running. And then I'd come in on Sunday nights at six o'clock and go through the weather news wires and memorize everything and make notes to myself on this big map that was up on the wall. I figured out that's how weather people did their jobs. There were no meteorologists doing, doing that kind of work back then. After about six months, we mutually agreed that I was not cut out to do the weather. <laughs> uh, and by then, there was a nice offer that had come along at, a, at the CBS station to be a reporter, which, by the way, the news director there called me up and he said, you know, you, I know you've been interested in working here. He said, Our, he didn't say it quite this way, but he said, she is leaving, she's pregnant, and I've lost my state legislature reporter. Would you like to come fill this job? And of course, I was thrilled and over the moon. But I was the one woman reporter who was hired to cover, also to cover. To replace the another woman reporter. Now, in his, to his yeah. credit, he ended up hiring more women after that. But yeah. in the beginning, it was one per station. 
Well, you worked so hard in those jobs that you ended up in an incredibly short period of time being hired by NBC News, I think in 1975. But tell us about the challenges you faced once you actually had sort of hit the big time getting, getting hired by a network well, I, I went knocking on the doors of the networks after five years, and you could say, well, why in such a hurry? Because I saw my colleagues leaving to go to big cities, bigger than Atlanta, and doing well, and I saw my life sort of passing me by as a 28-year-old. Um, <laughs> and I went and knocked on the door, cold call, spoke, spoke with vice presidents at each one of the networks. They all were just polite and said, Lee, goodbye, thank you, except for the NBC vice president who said, look, you know, go take, go back to Atlanta, work on your delivery, your voice delivery, call a voice coach, call me back in a year or two. So I w went back to Atlanta, went through the yellow pages, the young people here don't know what yellow pages are, <laughs> found a voice coach, called her up, lined her up for an appointment, but this NBC vice president called me in a week and said, we've just fired our reporter in the Southeastern Atlanta Bureau, Southeastern Bureau for NBC, and you know, sent us another audition tape and they hired me without any voice lessons. So I never did completely lose the southern accent that I had developed after living in the south for a while. Nothing wrong with a southern accent, right? It's, it's perfectly good to have a little bit of a southern accent. But uh, so he hired me and then I was the wildlife reporter for the next year. I literally was all over. I, was, I covered a blackbird kill in Kentucky. I covered fire ant plagues in South Georgia. I did an alligator farm story in Louisiana and I covered a hanging in the Bahamas. So um, that was sort of the, the, the barrier, the, the outer edges of the experience I got. But what I've left out in DERA is that when I was in Georgia covering the state legislature and state government, city government, I covered this little known peanut farmer who was running for governor then, James Earl Carter, who went on to be elected and to be governor. Turned out he was a very ambitious guy. He could only serve one term as governor and he went on to run for president. And NBC, I kept pestering NBC to let me cover him and they said, no, we've got people who are, have been around longer than you. You've only been here a year. Uh, so I had this very interesting kind of back and forth with, the, with my bosses at NBC. During that so how did you convince them? Because obviously you had to get them to get you on the campaign trail and then to Washington once he was president. I, I made a complete pest out of myself. I mean, I, I tried to break news, uh, which was not the easiest thing in the world because I was third or fourth on the totem pole behind, uh, behind some more senior reporters covering him. But I also just pestered them. I wrote letters, I called them, uh, and I kept making the case, I, am, I know these people, and they're going to Washington. You want somebody on the White House team who knows the Carter uh, the Carter strategist, the, the entire team, because he was bringing a lot of Atlanta people with him to Washington. And they hemmed and hawed and hemmed and hawed, and then it was the, literally the day before Christmas they called me up in 1976 uh, and said, uh, uh, okay, you're going to Washington, pack your bag, you'll be, the, be there in a couple of weeks. And so I went to Washington and was the, it, I was the third man on the totem pole covering the White House, uh, meaning I covered weekends, early mornings, the trips that nobody else wanted to cover. But it was a great way to learn. It was a great way to learn. Were there certain barriers or presumptions that you faced as a young female journalist at that time? Well, sure. I mean, it, it, our society was what it was. This was 1977, 78, 79. We had been through the women's movement. Um, there were still people I tried to talk to when I'm interviewing people on Capitol Hill or in the administration who just weren't used to talking to female reporters. There were more and more of us as time went by. But I can remember, um, you know, it, it, it's been in the news lately, and I know we're going to talk about it in a minute, but there, there would be senior legislators, senior members of Congress who were just not used to talking to women about um, what they were working on, a piece of legislation, or what was going on politically. And I found that over time, the way to, for me to get around that was just to do my job, to keep my head down, uh, to let them know that I was serious, uh, to be, and frankly, another thing I, I learned to do was to make good friends with a lot of the, the guy reporters. I mean, I was one of the girls on the bus at a time when it was mostly boys on the bus. Um, and I, I learned a lot from watching them uh, because I was new to politics in Washington. I was new to Washington, period. And I had to learn somehow 
Um, and so that experience of watching these other people who had been doing it for decades longer than I had, people like Johnny Apple of the New York Times, people like David Broder of the Washington Post, like my husband Al Hunt, uh, who had already then covered Congress for, for a number of years and was already a national political reporter for the Wall Street Journal. Um, there were a lot of people like that, as well as some women. There was a, an incredible woman reporter for NBC named Catherine Mackin, Cassie Mackin, who kind of took me under her wing. I see some people nodding out there. She kind of took me under her wing when I came to Washington and just said, look, you know, whatever, you, you know, doesn't make sense to you, if you need any advice behind the scenes, I'm here to help which I thought was extraordinary. Because before then, it wasn't so clear. You know, you, you didn't know who was a friend and who wasn't. It, networks can be a very competitive place. Well, you obviously worked incredibly hard and impressed all the people who were your colleagues. They mentored you, as you've just described, men and women. And you have made mentoring a central part of what you do in journalism. And uh, I remember I first met you 19 years ago when you and Al gave the readings at the wedding of one of my closest, oldest friends. Um, that woman had been your producer at CNN. Um, she wasn't anymore, and yet your relationship with her was so strong, you were asked to give the readings. You guys were sweet and funny and also a role model of a great couple. But what I remember most were my friend's stories about how tireless you were, your work ethic, and how the two of you would stay up till 2 o'clock in the morning preparing for campaign coverage when the other anchors, according to her and their producers, were like, oh, let's call it a day at 6 o'clock. You know, and the payoff was that you got great scoops. And I remember her telling me that during the time of the Clinton budget with Newt Gingrich and all of those machinations, that the White House was learning things about what were going on, what was going on in Capitol Hill from you. They were watching your reports to be able to find out what was happening behind the scenes. Um, when my friend years later had her first baby, you were the first person who came to the hospital before her family and friends. Um, um, which is pretty incredible. And what I have always found striking is you're so busy at work and with the array of nonprofits you advise, founding the International Women's Media Foundation and all of that, how do you make the time to pay it forward? And why is mentoring other journalists, especially women journalists, so important to you? Well, first of all, our mutual friend, uh, a woman named Rebecca Cooper, who's an incredible journalist herself, is way too generous. She's giving me far more credit than I deserve, Indira. But to your question about mentoring, I believe so fiercely in paying it forward. I mean, there were people like Cassie Mackin, who I mentioned. There, were, there have been men and women mentors in my life who've made an enormous difference. Um, so anything I I can do to help younger journalists, uh, women, men, uh, young journalists of color. Um, and frankly, I have to say at this moment, even though Gwen came along in my life, Gwen Eiffel came along in my life later, when I met Gwen, uh, we started working closely together at the News Hour in 2007, I saw her doing this kind of mentoring that you're describing. And I already felt that it was important, but Gwen, was doing it at an industrial strength. I mean, this woman <laughs> believed she would seek out young people. She made it a passion and a pursuit of hers. So both of us just believe fiercely in the need to speak to young journalists to make sure they are hearing about the values that drive us, uh, values that drove her, because we are paying it forward. We think, I mean, how, do, how do you learn about journalism? You learn. You, you learn some of this in school, but you learn a lot of it on the job, and you learn it from other journalists you respect and who are doing the hard work, the, the nitty-gritty work. And we thought, you know, we've got to do that. We've got to take every opportunity we can to reach out to other women journalists, as, we say, as I said, journalists, young people who just may not get that leg up that we need. It was one of the reasons I felt so strongly about the International Women's Media Foundation, uh, because that was a chance to take what women journalists had learned in this country and spread that around the world. I know I'm kind of changing the subject, but it is paying it forward in many regards because we have it for all of our complaints in this country about uh, the press and the press being under siege in this country. We have it so much better than so many other parts of this planet where journalists are not allowed to report freely. They are in jail. They are shot. They are, uh, they are uh, followed. Their families are threatened. 
And I learned that from working with the, uh, the IWMF, the International Women's Media Foundation. But, so I'm lumping it all together. I think that those of us who are privileged to, ha to do the work that we do have an obligation to pass it on. We talked about how you started out as a secretary, despite having a political science degree from Duke. Um, you now are- I was a fast typist, <laughs> which a reporter needs to be. Absolutely. Um, now you work as managing editor and anchor in a female majority newsroom at PBS NewsHour. As we talked about, you and Gwen made history by being the first all women um, evening news anchor team on a network. That's great progress in 45 years. But one thing that has not changed and we're now exposing and addressing or starting to is this pattern of sexual harassment of women in newsrooms by male supervisors. Of course, it happens in all um, industries, not just in the news. It just happens, you know, we're in the news, so let's talk about that. Fox News, NPR, The New Republic, Vox, and beyond. So I want to hear from you, how should newsrooms instill a culture where this doesn't happen? And how do you think we can best address it when it does? Well, it has been in the news lately, no question. And uh, uh, I think I probably don't know a single woman in our business who hasn't had to uh, deal with it at one point or another, at one degree or another. We've certainly heard about some of the worst of it uh, that's been in the headlines recently. Um, that's why, to me, it is so important that women are supporting each other so that when something like this happens, women are able to talk to other women and to other men who are supportive and to get the kind of support they need to get through those episodes. Clearly, from the news recently, not enough has been done. There are still uh, pockets of places. Uh, I don't believe it is rampant in our industry, but I believe there are pockets of places where it certainly has gone on. And, and may still be going on, probably is, uh, but now I think women are gathering the courage to speak up about it, and we have to celebrate that. But I look at this as part of a larger picture of the values in a newsroom. If we are going to report on the American to the American people about, for example, what's going on in our public life, what our public servants are doing, if we're going to hold them accountable, then we have to hold ourselves accountable too. We have to have newsrooms where we respect one another, where there's not um, a damaging kind of um, a lack of respect that goes on. And we've all worked in different, we've all here worked in different workplaces, in journalism, in business, in academics. When we've been in places where people have used a position of power uh, to take advantage of others. That happens in every line of work, I'm absolutely confident. Um, I think we journalists have a particular responsibility, though, before we go reporting on others, that we make sure our own house uh, has been um, checked. And uh, I, I feel very strongly about this. We talk about this a lot at the news hour. Uh, we were dismayed to learn about what, what, uh, what happened at NPR, uh, our sister organization, uh, radio. But um, it's something that we feel very strongly about. We've simply, we've recently reinforced our standards uh, with the news that's come out, and, and we'll continue to do that. And we've also been reporting on it on the program, and on the news hour, and we'll continue to occasionally talk about it on the news hour because I think we have to keep it along with some other important issues front and center before the American people. You have covered every presidential campaign since 1976, the Oklahoma City bombing, 9-11, a lot of the watershed moments of the last 45 years. What stands out to you as the best and worst moments in your career? Well, well let's, let's do the worst first. Um, I mean, certainly what has to be, uh, for me, uh, a moment that was uh, that I will never forget, and I remember it as Chris, as clearly as if it were yesterday. Was the day uh, that was mentioned earlier uh, that President Reagan was shot. I was he had only been in office a couple of months. I was in the what they call the press pool that day, so I traveled with a small group of reporters and the NBC camera crew to cover his speech at the Washington Hilton. And of course, we all know what happened. He came out the door afterwards, and John Hinckley, I was literally 20, 25 feet away. I was shouting a question to him about Lech Walesa, that something had happened in Poland that day when we heard this pop, pop, pop sound. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I will take that with me. Um, 
for the rest of my life. It was, a, it was something that reminded me very powerfully that journalists have to be prepared in an instant for, the, for, for, for life to change, for things to change. I saw Jim Brady, who was Ronald Reagan's press secretary, there lying on the ground, clearly uh, wounded, and, uh, uh, and, and yet we reporters have to maintain composure. Um, and w go on to report about it. Another night I will remember, which uh, I have to put in the, in the bad category, was I was on the air for CNN on that November night in the year 2000 when we were watching the election returns come in, mm -hmm. and we waited and waited and waited for Florida. Uh, <laughs> some of you may remember that night. Uh, and it was going one way, and then it was going another way, and they were hanging chads, and, which we would learn about only later. Um, it, but I remember I sat on that set with Bernard Shaw and Jeff Greenfield from, I think, 6 p.m. until literally 6 a.m. Not a one of us moved the whole night uh, because we couldn't, I mean, we just couldn't bear. The suspense was so huge. We were hearing early in the night that there may be some problems with some exit polls, Nobody wanted to take anything for granted. Clearly, CNN, along with virtually every other network, uh, news, major news organization, made, the wrong, made some wrong calls that night. And the rest is history. We went on for 38 days. Uh, we in the media, television news media, did not cover ourselves with glory uh, that night. Um, I would say in the good category, um, I mean, just you know, the, the fact of being part of the the Gwen Eiffel team uh, to be the first women to anchor a national newscast. That was very special. Gwen and I were humbled and thrilled by that uh, in, in 2013. And I think longer ago, a moment that I was proud of as a young reporter, I was covering the Camp David summit uh, at Thurmont, Maryland, when Jimmy Carter had Menachem Begin and Anwar Sadat there for 12 days, I guess it was, uh, and it looked like the whole thing was falling apart. And I got word from, I was working this story very hard in Deer. I was a young reporter that was trying to do my job. And I got word from a very good, actually a couple of sources, that, that it, was, it was going to come together, that it was premature to assume. And I made sure that John Chancellor, my boss then, in, sitting in the anchor desk in New York, did not go along with the other uh, news news organizations that night that predicted that, that it was going to fall apart, that it wasn't going to survive. So John was forever grateful to me, and it cemented our friendship for a long time. Uh, so there are some little things like that. Um, but there's many, many more things to celebrate than to, than to worry about. I watched your coverage on election night this past year, and I was struck by how calmly you announced um, the results of Donald Trump winning the presidency. And it was a really striking contrast flipping channels to the cable channels, where anchors were celebrating openly or mourning, adding drama and kind of shock and awe to their presentation. You have always felt strongly that news should be separate from commentary. We saw some of that in the video. I know that you've never been overly concerned about ratings. What do you, even though you've gotten good ones, but do you think that entertainment and partisan politics have hijacked the news? Speaking of ratings, the news hours ratings are up about twenty two percent. That's over why last I said year. <laughs> you've gotten good ratings. But I know I you're think, not obsessed with them like some I people. think I take no credit for that. I think the American people want news that they can count on uh, at this moment in our in our history. Um, we are in a fraught time in the media. Uh, we, as you heard Paul Steiger say, and by the way, I should have started out saying congratulations to my friend Paul Steiger. I'm so proud of you. Congratulations again. <laughs> Much more than a warm-up act. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, but this is a fraught time. We are being tested every day. Everything we put on the air, every tweet, every... Uh, news story for print reporters. Everything is being watched closely by the American people, and, and I mean, to the extent that they can. I mean, I, I mean, I don't mean literally every every word, but I mean in general, we are being watched like we never have before, and we have to be at 
our best right now because we have a leader, a political leader of this country who has done everything but call, I mean, he's called us enemies of the American people. We've heard that. That is not true. We are clearly not enemies. I am not the enemy of the American people. You aren't. Paul isn't nor any of the journalists in this room or any of the, many of the, the journalists who work for the incredible, hardworking mainstream news organizations that I can think of. Um, but we, we are at a moment when people are looking at the news and their opinion has risen and fact-based journalism has kind of taken a back seat to some extent. And I believe that for us to, to survive, for fact-based journalism to survive, we have to do that hard work every day. We've got to come in, figure out what stories matter, and spend time reporting on them, and put them out there. And in the end, I, it's not just because I'm, a, I'm naturally, I'm preternaturally an optimist. It's because I believe that the good will survive. It will arise. I mean, the good will rise in this country. We are going through a cycle right now. It's a tough time but we will come through it. And the way journalism has to come through it is by working as hard as we can to get those facts, to get that information, not to get distracted by the latest sparkly object that got thrown up in the air, but to, but to focus on what's important, to focus on what really matters in the lives of the American people from around the world, from this country, from communities, whether if you're a local journalist, a national or a journalist, a journalist who's covering the Middle East or Asia, uh, but to do your job as well as you can because our democracy does depend on it. You heard Bob Schieffer say it in the video from two years ago. It's even more true than it was today than it was then. We have to keep on keeping on. And by the way, and at the risk of going on too long here, I just want to say that one other thing we learned from this election is that we did not do a good enough job of, of covering the American people who are in the shadows of this country, who are not on the East and the West Coast, who don't live necessarily lives of privilege, who are struggling. We've got to find a way with our limited uh, resources, and it's not easy, but we've got to get out there and make sure we are, we are reporting on those people. They matter. And We should, be, we should be holding a mirror up to all of Americans, all of Americans, no matter where they live, no matter how much education they have, no matter what their political beliefs are. We can't stop covering a certain group of people because they have outrageous beliefs. We need to make sure people know what those beliefs are, and we need to talk about that and discuss that and debate it. That's what's made this democracy so strong, and that's why I'm so passionate to talk about journalism and, and what we do. Well, I hope that you're right when you say that optimistically you think this is a cycle and that we will get through this and that people don't think we're the enemy of the people. I fear the figures that show distrust in the mainstream media and I hope that's going to turn around. And part of that is now there's all this talk about fake news, both the made up stories and conspiracies that really are false things masquerading as news stories and the president's description of any critical media coverage. So I want to know, in an era of internet and cable, much of it is very partisan. Many news sources are reinforcing preconceived notions that people have, acting as sort of echo chambers rather than challenging them and informing them. Do you fear that we no longer have a commonly agreed upon set of facts? And what can we do about that? I don't know. I do fear that. I do worry about it a lot. Um, and I don't have an answer. I wish I were smart enough to sit here and say, here's what we need to do so that Americans can come together and like the days of Walter Cronkite uh, and uh, Huntley and Brinkley, people agreed on, you know, that A, B, and C happened and D, E, and F didn't happen. It's not that way anymore. People gravitate, so many people gravitate to the source of news that reflects what they already believe. Uh, we know that other countries, other democracies, um, have much more opinion-driven journalism than we do. And in fact, our opinion-driven, we had opinion-driven journalism in this country in our earliest days. It was only in the, really in the last century when we moved toward this more objective uh, uh, journalism uh, philosophy that we have. Um, do I think that we are forever going to be stuck with opinion only? 
Uh, I don't know. Um, I, it's not that, and, and let me just clarify, Indira, it's not that I think it's wrong. People should have opinions. People should have strong views. We should have these debates. But we need to have a set of facts and figures and data that we can count on. And so that when people look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics or they look at whatever the Fed put out or the, you know, name another Department of Government or the Climate Science Group that put that report out, that very dire concerning report out yesterday, that people say, oh, okay, so that's what's, now what are we going to do about it? We can argue about what we should do about it, but we accept it. Um, again, I have to be an optimist. I have to believe that if we keep doing our job, if we report the facts, if we stick to the facts, we don't try to embellish, and by the way, we admit it when we make a mistake. I think that's essential. We have to be transparent as journalists in what we do. Then I think we can get through this. Uh, but it's not, we're not talking about kumbaya. I don't see the country coming together and everybody agreeing. That's not who we are as a people. It shouldn't, that, that would be uh, un, way unrealistic. Um, but, but we need to be at a place where we can accept some of the same facts, absolutely. All right, well, I want to sort of bring it back to a personal note, which is you met your husband, Al, covering the 1976 campaign. Soon after, you became a White House correspondent and an anchor. He became the powerful Wall Street Journal bureau chief and a TV regular before going to Bloomberg as executive editor and a TV host. So long before Bill and Hillary came to town, before James Carville married Mary Maitland, you two were two halves of a big time Washington power couple. What are the ups and downs of being married to another journalist, and what truly is your secret to still being married uh, to Al 37 years later? Love you, Al. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. Um, uh, it, first of all, um, uh, I have to say how lucky I am to be married to this man who is not only an amazing journalist, he's just an amazing human being, an amazing father to our children. Uh, love you, Al. <laughs> um, um, but, you know, without accepting the whole power couple thing, it, it, journalists married to each other, I think, is a good thing because it takes one to kind of know the peculiar highs and lows. Who, they understand when you come home and you didn't get that interview or that story that you wanted, somebody beat you on a story that you really wanted. Um, we can be high and low like this. Um, the other thing, frankly, is that we don't, for the longest time, and, and even today, we'd come home and we only talked about the kids. I mean, it was how, how did Jeffrey do in math and what's going on and with the soccer game and Lauren's piano lesson. And um, that was, that really is what we mostly talk about. It's today, we're still, our kids are much older now, 36, 30, and 28. And we're still spending a lot of time talking about our kids. Um, and, and, and maybe that's the, that's the time that we live in. But um, what's the secret? I think it's, it's probably like any marriage. It's, it's, uh, it's supporting one another. I mean, Al has always been incredibly supportive of my career. And, uh, and I've certainly tried to be supportive of his career. And I think that makes a big difference. But I will say this, and dear, about kids. You didn't ask this that um, I, I'm not one who believes that women can have it all at the same time. I think there are trade-offs you make when you keep your career going as a mom and, and try to be a good mother. It's not the easiest thing in the world. And there were moments that I missed. I was in California covering Jerry Brown's campaign for the Senate uh, when Jeffrey Hunt took his first steps. So Al called me. He found me in the governor's in the in the he was then the governor called, found me in his office and said, "Guess what, Jeffrey?" And I burst into tears um, and because I wasn't FaceTime long before <laughs> the ability before that he FaceTime. could stream it for you. So there are moments clearly as I look back as a mom when I think, "Gee, I I mean many moments when I wish uh, because journalism doesn't accommodate much for." for family, but I've been very blessed to have a partner in Al and uh, frankly blessed to have three children who are uh, kind of amazing. So. Yeah. <laughs> all right, well, we're all here tonight to support Pointer's mission of thought leadership and professional training to bolster journalism's role in sustaining a healthy democracy. So at a time when there is such distrust in the mainstream media among some segments of the public, 
What do you think we here at Pointer should be doing to address that? How do you see our role? And you know, why bother supporting an organization like this? Oh, I think you are doing, you are already doing. I mean, everyone here has heard you know the mission a pointer to bring in journalists to give them an opportunity to think about what's important in this craft that we all love, uh, to give them training, uh, to, to have them participate in, in discussions and conversations about the whys and the wherefores and the, what, what's the driving philosophy behind what we do. Um, there's so many things. I met some young journalists who were here for just a few days. Uh, who, they came from all over the country. I think one was Seattle and maybe one was the East Coast and one was from Canada. And they were telling me about the, the program they're doing this week at Pointer. And of course, Pointer continues. I mean, to fact, I mean, there are just so many things uh, that Pointer does. Um, just keep on doing the great work that you are. And it's because it matters. We can't, I, it, it sounds like a broken record, but we are not going to keep up this democracy. We are not going to serve the American people unless we continue to have journalists who do uh, the great work that, journal, that Pointer is teaching journalists to do. Uh, so you really provide a unique, you, you occupy a unique place here, partly because of where you are geographically. I think it's important that you are here in Florida, that you're in the South in this important part of the country, that you're in this great community, and frankly, that you're not in the East Coast corridor where there's a lot of noise and a lot of conversation that goes on all the time, or on the, the West with its own share of sort of not listening to the rest of the country. You're in a place where you can listen and pay attention, and we can learn so much from you. So congratulations to Pointer. Keep up the great work you're doing. Well, Judy, thank you so much for sharing a bit of your life with us tonight and supporting our mission and for your incredible career dedicated to informing the public without fear or favor. Thank you.